Instead of being built around cars, cities should be designed around the distance of a quarter of an hour walk or bike ride. That's the mantra behind the 15-minute city project envisioned by Paris-based Professor Carlos Moreno, where work, housing, shops, schools and leisure options would all be within a person's immediate vicinity. Paris is one of Europe's oldest and most renowned cities, with architecture and a city design stretching back hundreds of years. But it's also in the vanguard of a new urban concept. One mainstay of Paris planning for the last 10 years has been the drive to increase the number of bike lanes. It's a crucial part of the 15-minute city project. Cycling is cheaper and healthier than driving. It's often faster as well, and it's growing more popular in the French capital. Yet there are detractors who say the roadworks needed to construct the lanes block up the city and impact those people who need to drive for work. This is in my opinion, one of the most uh, relevant cities for promoting by capability with the physical separation between cars uh, and bikes. We could cross today Paris uh, in the east to west, north south the diagonal uh, in, in, with a bike uh, without crossing a car. Cleaner and more accessible mobility options are another part of the project. In July, the mayor's office announced that, going forward, only three operators of self-service electric mopeds will be allowed in Paris. It's part of their strategy to permit and regulate shared transport options. But one of those options is being banned. From September the 1st, public e-scooters will be taken off the road. The mayor called a referendum on the issue in April and although the result was overwhelmingly in favour of outlawing e-scooters, only 7% of eligible Parisians turned out to vote. One of the companies which has been up till now permitted to have their e-scooters on the streets called the decision to ban them a step back for sustainable transport in Paris. But the mayor's office says they are a danger to pedestrians and also often an eyesore being dumped on and around the sidewalk. But shared e-scooters were seen by the French transport minister as a crucial part of Paris's green travel credentials. And he said the very low turnout in the vote was a massive democratic flop. This summer's heat wave in Europe has been another reminder of the warming world. And Carlos Moreno says climate change policies are directly linked to the 15-minute city concept. The global warming is uh, at the core of the emergence of the 15-minute city concept. He says that policies of permanently reallocating road space to pedestrians and cyclists and investing in nature-based solutions must be pursued. Inside the uh, cities, we have two sectors, transportation and buildings. I said at this moment, if we wanted to fight radically against uh, climate change, we needed to transform our cities for reducing the um, emission of CO2 by the transportations and to optimize the uses of uh, buildings. One way to decrease the temperatures in cities is to increase the level of tree shade. If tree canopies cover just under a third of a city, heat-related deaths could be reduced by nearly 40%. That's according to research published earlier this year by the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. Schools and safe access to them are another key part of Carlos Moreno's policy. Paris authorities have pedestrianized many of the streets in front of schools to try to provide more secure areas for children growing up in a busy city center. Having shops and services within easy reach is also part of this reimagining of how cities function. 
plus expanding public transport options, like the extension of the Paris Metro, especially in the underserved suburbs, and also its tram network. Professor Moreno says the COVID-19 pandemic was also a game changer, with the 15-minute city concept brought into the limelight. The lockdowns meant people were often restricted to only moving around their neighborhood, and they had to shop local and to work from home. They also stayed away from mass transportation, with an uptick in walking or cycling to get around. The global network of C40 cities have embraced this concept as the new backbone for developing the urban policy post-pandemic for promoting decarbonized mobilities, pedestrian and bike capability, local economy, uh, local uh, areas uh, for having a, a more human proximity, and the new economic models for developing more mixity. Next summer, the eyes of the sporting world will be on France for the Paris 2024 Olympics and Paralympics. And Professor Moreno thinks the Games will provide an opportunity to show up close how cities can be transformed. The Olympic Games um, uh, have promoted by uh, Anne Hidalgo uh, for uh, fostering the radical transformation of uh, Paris. We will show this uh, by capability, pedestrianizations, multi-services uh, functions, the social mixity with the social housing. Uh, we will have the Seine River for offering uh, this uh, new relationship. Some 56% of the world's population, that's 4.4 billion people, live in cities. The World Bank says that number is only set to rise, with the planet's population more than doubling its current size by 2050. With seven in every 10 people living in a city by the middle of the century, the environmental pressures on urban centers and the standards of living, learning and leisure will continue to grow. And urban lifestyle improvement projects, like the 15-minute city, are likely to come into even greater focus. After the break, we cross the channel over to the UK to see how the country assimilates the 15-minute city concept. In the UK, a number of areas have pledged to further examine the urban planning concept of 15-minute cities and see if it can be implemented. Among them is Bristol. It's a historically liberal, progressive and environmentally focused area. A new multi-million dollar scheme is being piloted that many hope could be the first step to more ambitious aims of achieving the country's climate goals. But a seemingly ever-changing political landscape in the UK is bringing central government funding for such projects into doubt. Welcome to Cotton Hill in Bristol, a possible vision of the future for the largest city in southwest England. Sections of road were closed here during the pandemic to help with social distancing and allow hospitality businesses to reopen safely. Two years on, local residents were given a series of options about what the future should hold. 90% of those who responded chose to keep the road closed to traffic permanently. One local politician who's been heavily involved in the scheme wants this to be the start of something bigger. It's absolutely something we need to be doing as cities, uh, you know, here in Bristol, in the UK and right across the world. We have a commitment to becoming uh, net zero by 2030 here in Bristol. and. Um, lots of cities have similar targets. To do that, we need to change the way people move around cities. We need to change the offer to people in our cities and in our neighbourhoods. And, and schemes like this are a critical way of doing that. Livable neighbourhoods, as they're known, are designed to be inclusive, attractive places where people can feel part of a community. It's a step below the concept of 15-minute cities, where you have everything you need within 15 minutes of your front door. But a huge part of both concepts is limiting traffic. 
some six kilometers east, seven and a half million dollars is being spent on the most ambitious scheme of its type in Bristol. Extensive public consultation has taken place to work with the community and target problem areas. The East Bristol Livable Neighbourhood Pilot Scheme is largely about traffic management. Keeping cars on main roads and reducing the speed and volume of traffic are key goals. I've talked to residents as well locally who say that they have to be really mindful whenever their kids come out, of the, out onto the street at any time because of how busy the roads are. Local campaigner Rob Breyer showed me some of the areas that will see changes. Relatively small scale to start, blocking off certain roads and creating some small pocket parks, but also addressing practical day-to-day -day issues that often keep people tied to their cars. The aim is just uh, to look at the whole area and go, what changes can we make that make it more livable, make it um, less dominated by tra uh, traffic and by pollution, both noise pollution and air pollution, uh, and make it a better place for people to, to live and walk around and, um, and be here. With so many of these schemes linked to traffic, persuading people to give up their cars is what campaigners see as the major challenge, but one that needs to be addressed if urban planning is going to help tackle climate change. Since 2016, transport has been the worst polluter in the UK. Cars might pollute less than they did, but there are more of them. Many people won't give up their cars because they don't feel safe cycling or scooting on the streets. Livable neighbourhood schemes should fix that. But there's also the wider issue of public transport, and many argue that significant long-term investment is needed if people are to be persuaded to swap their car keys for a bus pass. A temporary scheme to cut fares across the UK has been extended to the autumn in a bid to get more people onto public transport. But away from the city centres, bus routes have been slashed in many places. Back in Cotton Hill, Councillor Tom Hathaway likes to check in with local business owners about the impact of the pedestrianisation. Daniele Panunzio has finally realised the long-held dream of running his own gelateria. He puts its success down to a number of factors, but thinks the neighbourhood it's part of is the cherry on top. I think the, being in a pedestrian area helps because obviously gelato is one of those walking products. So having a lot of footfall, people that can come by bicycle with their children, their families, obviously it's a a boost for the location, yes. Of course, different schemes have different levels of popularity. In London, some low traffic neighbourhoods, or LTNs, have been met with fierce local opposition. This one in Dulwich is keeping traffic off side streets, meaning the main road is often solid with congestion. Traffic on one road alone has gone up by 250%. Since, since the introduction of our LTN, you have back-to-back -back traffic jams in the morning and in the afternoon. It's difficult to see how that's consistent with the objective of a 15-minute city. Public transport has to be a part of the solution. We need more electric buses, we need better train services, and also we do need, uh, we do need changes to make our roads safer for cyclists. That's got to be part of the holistic solution. In a turn of events, the current Transport Secretary has stripped central government funding for future schemes wanting to create car-free zones. Don't punish motorists and instead offer people more incentives to not drive is the thinking. Instead, $250 million worth of funding will be diverted to develop more cycle networks. The wider 15-minute city concept has also met with some unusual opposition. Conspiracy theorists in the UK have taken an urban planning concept and are selling it as a dystopian plan to control where people can go. The first step to a Hunger Games society where you're forced to stay in your zone is the theory. That led to a street protest in Oxford, a city famous worldwide for its academia. Of course, there's no proof of a conspiracy, but there are some genuine issues with neighbourhood improvement schemes. For many, the big one is gentrification. Transforming low-income and often high immigration communities can drive up rent, forcing people out of urban centres and any chance of living in a 15-minute city. Campaigner Rob Breyer accepts that 
but argues that much bigger changes are needed if you want to stop that from happening. I think there's definitely a case that when you improve an area, that makes it more attractive to people of you know, middle class, upper middle class, however you want to describe that, that's definitely the case. I think that's more of a symptom of the way that we deal with housing and the way that we deal with rents particularly. So we need to think more carefully, I think, about how we put together that 15 minute co concept with the idea that people should be able to remain in their communities and continue to be able to pay rent. It's things like, on a national level, things like rent controls and you have an, a, a situation where we can't keep spiralling, spiralling, spiralling um, out of control with our rents. There needs to be some kind of management of that. As the pilot scheme gets underway in Bristol, campaigners have vowed to keep talking to residents to get their feedback. Some argue that this should only be the beginning, that much bigger plans are needed to truly make neighbourhoods livable and get somewhere near the concept of the 15-minute city. After the break, we'll head to Southeast Asia and look at how Singapore adopted its version of the 15-minute city decades ago, during the early stages of state building. Getting ready for a brand new day. Carmen C is taking a six-year-old daughter to school about 10 minutes away on foot. And in mere minutes, her four-year-old son is at his nearby nursery. Around the neighborhood, there's a library, stadium, hawker centers, supermarkets, pretty much everything people would need, all within reach of 10 minutes or less. There are also three malls near a train station and bus interchange. We were very self-sufficient in that sense. Uh, we've, got, um, we've got playgrounds, tons of playgrounds. You know, some of the new estates have got really fun playgrounds. Carmen lives in Tampanese. It's Singapore's first regional centre that started in the 1990s, then came Woodlands in the north and Jurong East in the west. The idea is to move retail and commercial activities out of the CBD in the south. This means jobs are closer to homes with less travelling needed. These places have since grown. For instance, in the northeast, there's a new Pungo Digital District that houses startups and innovation close to residential areas. Where there are hubs, there's also need for spokes to knit these places closely together in the city-state. Here's where a 20-year master plan for the transport system comes in. New expressways are being built like the North-South Corridor. Public transport routes are also coming up to cut travel time to the city centre. One example is the MRT system, from five stations to eight lines. With the new Thompson East Coast MRT line, people can now save 40% on travel time from the north to town. That same journey in the past, from say Bright Hill to Gardens by the Bay, would have needed at least an hour with a trip by bus and train. There are also cycling paths set to double to 1,300 kilometres in the next decade. The good thing about less travelling time is that it also means less carbon emissions. All new towns are connected and that makes the commute a lot easier and makes the car less necessary. In the sense that if you want to go uh, car light, we can because there are options. And if you have a very good MRT system supplemented with a good bus system, we will be a lot less reliant on, the pri uh, on private transport. Going green is also good for accessibility. The country is creating green spaces that form links between towns. It calls them park connectors, and these snake across the island. So basically the concept is to optimise land use, to make use of uh, underutilised spaces like road reserves, drainage reserves, to form green corridors that function as uh, recreational spaces amidst greenery. So this is one way to optimise land use and to convert these underutilised spaces into uh, useful green corridors for recreation. 
There are plans to have 500 kilometers of these pathways by 2030, and everyone will be a 10-minute walk away from a park. But with so many needs and so little space on the tiny island, the Urban Redevelopment Authority has its work cut out for it. The agency has a master plan for the next 10 to 15 years and an even longer one for the next 50 years. This includes catering for our economic needs, our social needs, as well as all the other utilities that we need to provide for. In addition, as a nation state, we also need to cater land for uh, planning for defence needs and all that. So being a multiracial and multi-religious society, we also make, take it upon ourselves to make sure that we create community spaces and social spaces that actually facilitate interactions between the different community groups. But some experts I spoke with say that urban planning must change because of crises like COVID-19. Perhaps in public spaces, we need alternative walk paths for people to bring uh, infected persons out of a building, for example. The other consideration is working from home. During the pandemic, many of us shifted to telecommuting. So going forward, I think we need more co-working spaces where people can work safely from near where they live rather than going into office. We need to think about homes that are a little bit larger where there's space for working from home. Some analysts have suggested constructing more what's called mixed-use developments, essentially many users all in one complex or a single compound. I'm here at King Albert Park in the West. It's a place with multiple users. Above it is more than 140 homes and below three levels of businesses and offices. There's a mini-mart, a couple of cafes, a movie theatre on the first floor and a few tuition centres on the second floor. Imagine you're running a business and your supplier is quite nearby. So I think there are some intangible economic benefits that may emerge from a mixed-use zoning like that. I think Singapore is shifting towards a, a, carbon, a light carbon kind of industry and having clean industry co-located with residents will help a lot. Another way the government improves accessibility is simply rejuvenating existing buildings. Old spaces are updated with new amenities. Take for instance Kampung Glam, a colonial era neighbourhood. A new plan to refresh the area's heritage and cultural offerings to help businesses thrive there. Ultimately, the country is quite literally always a work in progress. The government gets feedback from people to understand new needs, whether it's on housing or recreation. In a way, a more connected city also means a closer community to live, work, play.